Tiger and Osiris Rex, moderated by Mike Buckley. Take it away, Mike. All right, thanks, Sherry. Okay, we sit down here. Uh, well, welcome back, everybody, to the crowd here at the Applied Physics Laboratory and to everybody watching at the locations around the country. Um, this is, I'm, I'm excited about this panel discussion and, and the topic we're going to cover. I guess we're, we're calling it far in and far out, right? And then the, the scale of, of exploration. But what it comes down to is getting from one place to another and the work that goes into that. You may probably all remember an old ad for a cruise line, right? Getting there is half the fun. Um, when it comes to space missions, though, I think getting there is most of the challenge and figuring out the way to get to the place where you want to study. And we're going to look at that from the perspective of three different missions going to very different places in the solar system. You have the New Horizons mission on its way to Pluto, the MESSENGER mission, which is orbiting Mercury, and the OSIRIS-REx mission on, or, that will go to asteroid Bennu. Uh, and the panelists that we have here will bring us into the, the work that goes into getting to these places. So I'll introduce the panelists into a little bit about each of them. Uh, Hal Weaver who is the project scientist for the New Horizons mission, has also been involved in studying uh, comets and other bodies with Hubble Space Telescope. Gabe Rogers. Uh, Gabe is the guidance and control lead engineer for the New Horizons mission, uh, has also worked on several other space missions in his 16 years at the Applied Physics Laboratory. Uh, Ralph McNutt, who is the project scientist for the MESSENGER mission, also a principal investigator or an instrument investigator on the New Horizons mission, uh, and has worked on several others that I can't list right here, but has been all over the solar system and beyond in some of the studies. And Olivier Barnouin, who is a co-investigator on OSIRIS-REx, but has also worked on the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, Hayabusa, and the Near-Earth Asteroid Rendezvous mission. So what we'll do is just have each of you, we're going to discuss the, the different missions, and the roles in these and talking about designing them and where we're going from here. So we'll just start with Hal and then we'll move down the panel. Okay, hello everybody, it's great to be here. I'm gonna start with Far Out, because uh, this is about the Pluto mission, uh, the New Horizons mission. Um, you can have the next slide. Um, this is a, uh, the first time we're going to this new portion of the solar system, uh, the solar system's third zone, uh, we, we normally divide the solar system into three different zones. The terrestrial plant, planet region, where we have the rocky planets, including the Earth. The giant planets, uh, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. But just in the last couple of decades, we've discovered a whole new region of the solar system that's teeming with objects that we didn't know were there. Um, and this mission, the New Horizons mission, was selected as the top priority in the last decade of, for a mission to explore in situ the objects in this new portion of the solar system. We launched in January of 2006, fastest spacecraft to leave the Earth. We got to Jupiter in only 13 months, record-setting time. We had a gravity assist, and now we're on our way to, to Pluto. Uh, it takes nine and a half years total to get there, because we're way the heck out there. <laughs> more than 30 times farther from the sun than the Earth is, more than three billion miles away. Uh, but we're on a beeline, and it still takes nine and a half years. And so we're not going to stop there, though. We hope to actually, after we go fly past Pluto uh, next summer, so just a little over a year from now, July the 14th, 2015, is our closest approach date, uh, we hope to then continue and explore another Kuiper Belt object, probably roughly three years after we fly by Pluto. Okay, so if we go to the next slide, just to give you a... Uh, a feeling for the scale of what we're what we're doing here. Uh, this is a picture showing you all of the objects, all of the known objects in the solar system, as viewed from above the plane where the Earth and Jupiter rotate around the Sun. It's called the ecliptic plane, where all the major planets lie in a single plane. And now we're looking from above the Earth in this figure. The orbit of the Earth is you can barely see at the very center. Of the, uh, of the screen there. All of those little yellow dots are Kuiper Belt objects. The comets are these little arrow-shaped things. You think the, 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 the comets that we see here, most of them are coming from, in fact, the uh, Kuiper Belt. Pluto is that little purple ellipse. And what the first thing you notice here is 
All of the other orbits through the planets are very circular. Uh, Pluto's is highly elongated. It's more egg-shaped. That's because the orbit is elliptical with an eccentricity, uh, ellipticity of about 25%. Um, so this is the view from above. If you go to the next slide, looking at it from the side, this shows you another peculiar thing about Pluto and the other objects in the Kuiper belt. They're not in that plane. Pluto's, the, the, the plane in which Pluto rotates around the sun is tilted by about 17 degrees uh, to the ecliptic plane. And this really is the frontier of planetary science, uh, the export, in situ exploration of objects in the Kuiper belt. This is something we, we've never done before. Uh, in a year, a little over a year from now, you're going to see up close and personal for the first time what these objects look like. If you go to the next slide, it's tough to study the objects in the Kuiper belt, including Pluto and everything in the Pluto system, from so far away from Earth's vantage point. Even with the Hubble T Space Telescope, it's really hard. But people have been doing it for quite a while now. And but just about everything we know about Pluto, you can summarize just in two slides, which we have here. We know <laughs> we know it's it's rotational period very accurately. Uh, we know we don't actually don't even know exactly how big it is because it has a very thin atmosphere that kind of fuzzes off the edge a little bit. And it won't be until New Horizons get there that we really hone in on the exact size of, of Pluto. Uh, we know what its mass is. It was funny at the time that Pluto was discovered in 1930 by Clyde Tombo. Uh, people thought that it was much much more massive than what we know that it really is now. And if you plotted the the mass of Pluto as a function of time, people's estimates. It'd be below zero by now, <laughs> back in 1930 all the way to the modern times. Uh, but, you know, we now know better. Oops, we lost our presentation. Could you go to the next slide when you're ready? Just a sec. Sorry, the far end is not showing up correctly for that. Oh, uh, okay. That's fine. So, you know, Pluto, I mean, there are some things we, we do know that even though it's it's just a, a fuzzy dot to us right now. We know that it's one of the most highly variegated objects. By that, I mean colored. There's lots of different colors on Pluto, a huge range of brightness of the surface. And, but we don't really know what's producing those effects on Pluto. And that's what we're going to learn by the, with the New Horizons mission. So if you look at that little fuzzy thing in the lower left, here's the, the best telescope ever invented, <laughs> uh, a Hubble Space Telescope trying to, you know, make out Pluto as best it can. And it's just this little pixelated blob, you know, roughly uh, five to ten pixels across. Um, if you go to the next slide, once again showing you another Hubble image down in the lower left, and look at the dramatic difference with the kind of resolution we expect to get with the New Horizons cameras. As it, as it flies past. The 0.6 kilometer per pixel image down there, the, the thing that's labeled that, um, that shows you the surface of one of the Galilean satellites at, the, at, the, at that resolution. And that's the resolution that we expect to get with our color camera over all of Pluto. The, the little inset there that says 0.1 kilometers per pixel, we're actually going to get little pieces of Pluto at that kind of resolution. Just look at the dramatic increase in the information between the little pixelated Hubble image and, and the, uh, uh, the detailed image that we're going to get with New Horizons. If you go to the next slide, the other fascinating thing that we've discovered about the Pluto system, when it was first discovered, of course, Kai Tambo in 1930 was one object. It took 50 years. It wasn't until 1978 that Jim Christie at the United States Naval Observatory took this picture. And Pluto and he expected it to be more or less round, but it had this little spur on it. And as he observed it over a period of a week, that little spur rotated around. And he went to one of his colleagues at the Naval Observatory, Bob Harrington. We have a we have a satellite. That was that was the yeah, you know, and it was moving around. It's about 6.4 days. Okay, so that's this is the state of the art in 1978. You go to the next slide. Now you fast forward 17 more. 17 more years to 2005, after the New Horizons mission was selected by NASA, we decided, well, we have to focus the best facilities available on the Earth to look at Pluto and take inventory of you know, what's there. Um, 
you know, try and see if there's anything else there besides Pluto and Sharon. This we tried several times and were turned down, you know, originally <laughs> three different times. In fact, it was only because an instrument failed on Hubble that we snuck in <laughs> two orbits of observations in May of 2005 and discovered two new satellites, Nixon Hydra, now called Nixon Hydra. OK, but we didn't stop there. Go to the next slide. In 2011. Uh, we, in, you know, we, we figured out a new technique for looking even fainter. We found another satellite. It was called P4 at the time. This is now called Kerberos. Go to the next slide. The next year, did the same thing. Matt Nelton, the director of Space Telescope Sciences, said, he said, I'm not going to give you any more time. <laughs> we keep finding something every year. We give you more time. You know, so imagine this, this little Pluto, which is only about three quarters the size of the Earth's moon, has this little satellite system, you know, has four other satellites, four other small satellites and another big satellite. One is a, you know, it's a binary planet system, actually, you know, um, with, with Sharon. So uh, it's really a, it's like a, you know, solar system in microcosm. How the heck did it get to be that way? Well, the mystery of that we hope to resolve to some degree anyway by the New Horizons mission. Go to the next slide. This is our best image taken with Hubble. It shows all the satellites. Uh, all that bright background light is because Pluto and Sharon are so bright relative to these very small satellites. You're looking at a huge dynamic range here. It, you know, it's, it's about a factor of, uh, you know, 100,000, 150,000 the bright, brightness in Pluto compared to the brightness of Styx, the famous satellite. Okay, if you go to the next slide, which is my final, oh, I got two more. So this just shows you a cartoon and showing you this little mini solar system with all their satellites. So you go out from, from Pluto, you go to Sharon, Styx, Nix, Kerberos, and Hydra. That's the family that we know now. As we approach the Pluto system with the New Horizons mission, we're going to be looking for other satellites. Okay, and then the next slide, this shows you the, the geometry of our path through the Pluto system. Pluto, that whole, you know, that, that, that plane that contains Pluto, Sharon, and all the other satellites is tilted with respect to the ecliptic plane, which is that blue plane there. And that red line shows you the trajectory of the New Horizons mission. So at this point, I want to turn it over to Gabe, who is the one who is going to help us to point all the, the instruments on the New Horizons spacecraft toward those objects. Thank you very much, Hal. So um, the question is, how do we get there? How do we get to Pluto and get all of this great uh, science data? So the first way, since Pluto is so far out um, and we want to get there in a reasonable amount of time, you basically have to get the biggest rocket that you possibly can and put a very small spacecraft on it and then launch it off. And even then, it's, as Hal said, it's going to take nine and a half years. So this is uh, an Atlas rocket. And if you click, you'll see a little circle. That is our spacecraft on the top of three different <laughs> stages. And so uh, we're sitting atop this 200-foot uh, basically launch vehicle, and the launch was spectacular. I highly recommend you go onto uh, the internet and view the launch because it was beautiful. Uh, next slide. So with all of that energy, what do you get? Well, as Hal alluded, you get a historic launch. Um, we basically were the fastest Earth departure ever, about uh, 58,000 kilometers per hour. We passed the moon in nine hours, uh, about 13 months to get um, a gravity assist from Jupiter. And right now, we're, we're actually coming up on Neptune, which we're going to be uh, crossing this year. Um, the mass of the spacecraft, as I said, it's, it's actually quite small for a spacecraft, only a little more than a thousand pounds. Um, we carry a very little amount of uh, propellant on board in order to change our trajectory and stuff. Most of the energy came from launch and from Jupiter, as I'll talk to you later. Um, we carry an RTG, which is our power and heat source. Um, it basically is going to generate about 200 watts of power for us when we get to Pluto. So all the instruments, all the science is going to be collected with a bit more than two old incandescent light bulbs. And you get all of that for the low, low cost of $710 million. <laughs> Next slide. So this is our instrument suite. Uh, we have seven uh, different instruments. Uh, Lori, Rex, Alice, Ralph, uh, student desk counter, 
swap and Pepsi. Yes, it is the Honeymooners. <laughs> and um, Rex is going to basically collect radio data. Alice and Ralph are spectrometers. Uh, Lori is one of actually my personal favorite instruments. It's the uh, and it's health. It's the long range imager. It's going to take uh, basically pictures of, of Pluto and be used for optical navigation. It basically tells us where the spacecraft is with respect to the planet so we can actually get to the right place at the right time. Uh, next slide. So um, after launch, basically all the steering for New Horizons is done with thrusters. We've got essentially two sets of thrusters. One set is basically going to correct our trajectory. So even though we had a wonderful sh uh, shot towards Pluto, occasionally we have to, to tweak our, or our, our trajectory. And so that's what uh, we've got those four thrusters are. Then once we get to Pluto, all of the um, observations are going to be done using what's called three-axis attitude control. Basically, we reorient the spacecraft in space in order to point the imagers at the right uh, spot on Pluto at the right time. And so everything is done using thrusters for control. Next slide. So even though we had this very large uh, launch vehicle that got us going in the right direction, that still wasn't enough energy to get us there as quickly as we wanted to. So we actually performed a gravity assist of Jupiter back in 2007. Uh, we actually conducted this about 2.6 million kilometers from the planet, so we were actually outside the high radiation environment, so we wouldn't fry the spacecraft. Uh, and it increased uh, the velocity by uh, over 13,000 kilometers per hour. And that reduced um, flight time by up to five years. I say up to because it depended on which day we launched as to how much time the uh, Jupiter gravity assist would actually take off our travel time. And in, in an added bonus, we got a lot of science data. There's no count there. Uh, <laughs> so where are we now? Um, right now, we are just about to the uh, orbit of Neptune, which we're going to cross late this summer. And then where are we going? So next. So we have a final annual checkout this summer where we're going to basically run the spacecraft through its paces, um, collect some um, science calibration images, and perform the first optical navigation images. So we're going to take pictures with Lori of Pluto and Sharon and find out where we are with respect to them. Um, then starting in 2015, um, we're going to conduct three basically periods of approach phase science. Uh, early AP1 from January to April is basically taking plasma science and taking, again, more optical navigation images and correcting our trajectory. AP2 is basically increased uh, science, and that's where we get better than Hubble images. And that's when the scientists really start to get excited. There's a brief spin uh, mode downlink where we downlink a bunch of data. And then basically starting in June through July is where we get all the uh, high accuracy science. And there's a nine day window of time what we should call the core load, where we're going to collect a just a ton of, of data and really put the spacecraft and the spacecraft team through its paces. Um, it takes about 16 months, um, give or take, to play back all of the data that we're going to collect. In that time. Uh, next slide. So as Hal alluded, we're basically hitting a bullseye. Um, basically, the system is sort of edge on to us, um, or sort of like a dartboard to us. Uh, we're actually going to cross behind Pluto and Sharon in their shadows and actually collect occultation data, which is actually going to help us determine how big the planets are and what's basically in the atmosphere, um, which is really going to be an exciting time. Um, next slide. And so this is a movie of basically what's going to happen with the 22 hours from closest approach. And it's really sped up um, here, so you're not going to get much detail. Um, however, you're going to get to see just how many twists and turns we do in that 22-hour uh, period. Um, in each, and that's a, that was a plasma roll, that little spinning thing there. The plasma roll, I think, runs. Yep. And the different colors mean those are different instruments. Those are different instruments, yes. And then we basically do an occultation, uh, the Pluto occultation. We do a little barrel roll there to get some plasma, and then we do the share. And we actually do a lot more data collection after that. Um, I just didn't, just didn't have time to show it. Good, so. so we know we have the term. So next summer, the dance is the plasma roll. Yes. <laughs> or the move is what we're doing next time. Yes, that, exactly. Right? So let's go to the other end of the solar system. So that's where New Horizons is headed. Let's move in a little bit closer to the sun, like way closer to the sun. 
And Ralph McNutt can tell us about what Messenger is, is doing. The challenges of getting to Mercury, which you would think for a planet that's sometimes closer to Earth than any other, it'd be easy, right? Well, you'd think so. And then you take a look at it and you realize it's not. So it's good being here. Thank you, Mike. Uh, yeah, so we're moving into uh, almost to 0.3 AU, so 100 times closer than Pluto is to the Sun. You go to the next slide. So a lot of people say, well, why do you want to go there in the first place? And this was actually a question that was posed uh, back in 1996. We were, this was, uh, Messenger was one of the uh, early discovery proposals. This was a competition uh, within the science community with NASA. We originally proposed in 96. We lost the first time around. We proposed a couple of years later and was, and was selected for flight. And basically the idea was that Mercury is one of the terrestrial planets, like the Earth and Venus and Mars. And as an end member of that group, that being the one closest to the sun, trying to learn about Mercury helps to tell us about all of them and help, helps to go back and actually tell us something about ourselves as well here on this planet. And it turned out that in, in sort of the early... 2000s, there was a good alignment, and I'll talk a little bit more about that, about being able to use gravity assist to actually get into Mercury in an efficient way because, as Mike was alluding to, actually it's very, very difficult to get to Mercury. If you can go to the next slide. So this gives you an idea of what we went through. We actually had six planetary gravity assists to help slow the, slow the spacecraft down. Uh, Gabe was talking about the New Horizons spacecraft being about 478 uh, kilograms. We were actually on Messenger, we were about uh, 1,100 kilograms at launch, but about half of that was, was propellant, was fuel. We actually changed the speed of the spacecraft using the onboard rocket engine by about uh, a little bit over two kilometers per second over the course of the mission, but that was not nearly enough to actually be able to get into the sun. Because if you think about it, uh, Mercury being closer to the sun and the sun's gravity, well, the actual the energy is lower even though Mercury goes around the sun faster. And so what we had to do was to kill off the 30 kilometers a second of speed that Earth has going around the, around the sun. You have to lose the energy, you have to lose the angular momentum. And so we went by the Earth once, we went by Venus twice, and we went by Mercury three times before we had lost enough energy to actually be able to use what was left on the spacecraft, still something like about 900 uh, meters per second of capability, to actually break into orbit. And so six, six and a half year flight, uh, we left the Earth uh, coming up on 10 years ago, and we actually got there about three years ago in, in 2011. If I could go to, the, and I should mention we went, uh, I, like to, I like to brag about this one, we went, we went up almost 16 times around the sun in the course of all of this, and of course, as you go in closer to the sun, you go faster. So Mercury has actually traveled more miles than New Horizons at this point in time. Well, uh, messenger, yeah, that's sorry. Right. <laughs> I'll, I'll get it right here in a minute. If I could go to the next one, please. So there were a lot of firsts that were involved with the, involved with the, the Messenger spacecraft, including orbiting Mercury. We actually used some solar sailing. Uh, to eliminate some of the trajectory correction maneuvers. Didn't make a lot of difference, but it made enough that we were able to simplify a lot of what we had done our, done our planning for. We have a phased array antenna for, uh, actually that's for communication. And uh, the idea there was that if we'd have had to have used a steerable antenna, we would have had to have done a lot of testing because it was going to be very hot and we worry about moving things in the heat. So it's electronically steered. We were able that way to actually be able to save on testing when we were putting the spacecraft together. Uh, the sunshade is actually made out of the same material that is, uh, was used as an insulator around the shuttle main engines. Uh, it heats up to about 390 degrees centigrade. It's made out of a woven glass fabric, and that's what protects us from the sun because it's kind of toasty in there. We get in as close as 0.3 AU, of course, 0.308 AU from the sun at, our, at Mercury's perihelion. Uh, the fuel tank designs, the fuel tanks, again, they were custom as well in order to enable us to have this large amount of Delta V to get in. We've actually demonstrated laser transmission in space across the longest distance to date. And then there's a thing called Cybox. It was a mission planning tool. Without this, and without that software, there's just simply no way that we could have planned all of the observations on this mission. And if I could go to the next slide, please. 
what I'd like to do is to tell you a little bit about the science. And we've been there for three years now. We've completed 3,000 orbits of the planet. We've taken over 200,000 images of Mercury, all sorts of different resolutions and 11 different colors. We've collected millions and millions of spectra with the various spectrometers. Also look with, with particle instruments as well. We've learned a lot. Um, this was actually a picture of, of Mercury from the, from the very first flyby back in 2008. There had been a big question from the Mariner 10 flybys uh, that were made back in the mid-1970s about to what extent that uh, volcanism had played a role in the geological history of Mercury. And what we found is practically the entire planet was shaped by volcanism and, uh, and widespread magma flows early on in the plasma and early on in the planet's history. Uh, nothing like Maria on the moon. It looks a lot like the lunar highlands. And one of the things that was actually people had actually wondered about was the composition. And with the gamma ray and neutron spectrometer, the X-ray spectrometers on board, we've able to we've been able to show that the elemental composition is actually more like that of moon and, and or more like that rather of the Earth and, and Venus and Mars than like the moon. Really, it looks a little bit like the moon, but it's not the moon. I can go to the next slide, please. So one of the other things that we discovered were the so-called hollows. These are some geological features that are just not seen anywhere else in the solar system. Some things on Mars kind of look like, and this is actually a, this is a, another cover of Science Magazine. This is a color-stretched image. You just look at Mercury, it looks pretty uniform and gray. But what we found was that there are these bright deposits within impact craters that are widely all over the planet. They almost look like blowouts of volatiles, and we've actually wondered if that these are uh, perhaps newer features in the geology that relate to some of the volatile materials that we found on the surface of, of Mercury. For example, uh, we see sulfur, we see potassium, uh, things that you don't see in those kinds of concentrations. For example, on the Moon, and you wouldn't see on Mercury if there had been a lot of a lot of heating that had blown the volatiles off early in the planet's history. If I go to the next slide. So one of the other things that we've been working on for a long time with the, with the instruments on Messenger is looking near the, near the polar region, regions. This is actually a collage of uh, figures from the various Messenger images at Mercury's North Pole. The, uh, the bluer areas correspond to permanently shadowed craters. We'd known from radar observations from Arecibo and Goldstone early on that there were these very funny uh, re reflections in radar from, the, from the, some of the craters, or apparently the craters the poles of Mercury, that for all the world looked like we were looking at water ice. And of course, everybody said, well, this is one of the hottest places in the solar system. Who the devil ordered that? Well, we've been able to look with, with Mercury, with Messenger rather, uh, using the neutron spectrometer, using the, the laser altimeter, being able to look at which of the craters are actually in permanent shadow. We've been able to line those up with these radar images, and then by again looking at the neutron spectra, we've been able to show that all of this really is consistent with ancient water ice, down to a few, few tons of, of Kelvin above absolute zero in these craters, again, in one of the hottest places in the solar system. And that's all consistent. And so really what's happened is that we've revealed a new world. Uh, there had been the brief, three brief flybys by Mariner 10 back in the mid-70s, but we've really been able to look at the undiscovered country, at all of the things that have gone into making this planet. With, uh, with Mariner 10, we'd only seen about 40% of the planet, and we've now mapped the entire planet with an average resolution of better than something better than 200 meters. We've got the first full maps. Again, I mentioned the elemental composition. A lot of the geology features, Mercury shrank when it was cooling down early in its history. We've been characterizing that. And we've also been looking at the magnetic field of the planet. Mercury's got the only active dynamo, like the Earth, amongst the terrestrial planets. Uh, there's remnant magnetization on Mars, but no active dynamo now. But Mercury currently still has an active magnetic field, apparently very much like that of the Earth, but running along a lot faster uh, in terms of the dynamo. Uh, the energetics that are generated in the magnetosphere. And it's taught us a lot about how much, how unique that the Earth really is and what may have helped to shape the, shape the, the planet that we actually live on. I go to the next slide, and if you can kick it, there we go. So this is what Mercury looks like. This is a stretched false color. Again, if you were looking at it with your, just with your naked eye, it would look very gray. 
uh, but this pulls out all the geological features. You can see a lot of the rays across the, the planet structure, a lot of the newer craters, uh, the bluer areas that are apparently associated with some of the new areas, the areas up toward the North Pole that are associated with these very ancient uh, lava flows, again, from the volcanism early in the history of the planet. And just to end up, if I could have the final one. So, you know, the other question that I always get asked is, well, you know, why are we doing all this? I mean, Messenger is not as expensive as New Horizons. We're, we're still under a half a billion dollars, about about the, the cost of Mariner 10, which cost $100 million back in the mid-70s, but there's been about a factor of five in inflation since then. And, uh, you know, it really is all about exploration. It's all about finding the world around us. And it's something that enables us to learn more about uh, where we live here. So with that, I'll turn it over to Olivia. Yeah, so, so yeah, I'm going to talk about a lot closer to home. Um, we're going to talk about the Cyrus Rex um, mission. It's an asteroid sample return mission. It's actually the most expensive of these three missions. Uh, we're just at about a billion dollars. Um, and, and this is uh, really following up on the heels next slide of what's been done in the past with Astrid. If you kick it off, you'll get to see the near movie, too. Um, so actually, in the early 2000s, APL built the first spacecraft that brought in food, uh, the near asteroid. Ralph was a member of that team. Mm -hmm. um, and then Hayabusa, a Japanese uh, effort in about 2000 that I happened to work on, uh, actually returned a first minute sample from the surface of this asteroid called Tokawa, um, both are S-type asteroids. Um, the next sort of leap forward is to actually go to an asteroid and collect a large sample. Why do we want a sample? Samples are really useful to get at the geochemical history and surface evolution of an asteroid. It gives you way more information than whatever you could do through orbital rendezvous and, and things like that. So, so this is the next step uh, that NASA's decided to go forward. It was a competed mission. It was Second missions selected under New, uh, New Frontiers, so uh, New Horizons was the first. Uh, uh, we're going to a, what's called the B-type asteroid, which is, a, uh, we believe it's a volatile-rich asteroid, um, maybe closely related to a C-type or carbonaceous chondrite. It has um, the closest sample, we believe, on Earth that sort of matches this asteroid is the Takish Lake chondrite. I don't know if you've ever heard of it. It's a very crumply um, meteorite that was discovered out in, in Canada a few years ago. Um, the, what we're doing is we're going to be, we, we're going to an object that we don't actually know anything about. Okay? I'll show you what we know about it in a second. Um, so we have to do the whole rendezvous mission like we did for near, and then go down, collect the sample, get off the surface, bring the sample back to Earth. Okay, um, a lot of this is enabled because we're dealing with a small object. Our object is about 500 meters across, just like the Itokawa object. Uh, and so gravity is our friend in this case. Uh, well, and as, as like on New Horizons, our friend, maybe not so much for Messenger. That's why we had to slow down so much because the sun was bothering us. Uh, next slide. Uh, so this is just sort of a quick overview. So we're still, we just got um, through what's called CDR, which is, means our final design for the mission is, is done. Uh, and we're going forward and building hardware. Um, the only one instrument that's not through CDR yet is happening next week is the instrument I'm involved with, of course. Um, <laughs> um, but that's, uh, uh, that's a Canadian contributed uh, instrument. And so they're on a little slightly different timeline than the rest of the mission. Um, anyway, currently the uh, planned launch is, is in uh, September. There you see the window between September and October 2016. Uh, it takes us about uh, 600 days, nearly 700 days to get close to the asteroid. Then we start actually doing our approach and our survey modes, which are at some distance. We actually go into orbit around the asteroid, so that's kind of interesting to go into the orbit around a small object that has very low G, you know, um, and then having, you have a lot of solar pressure forces that you have to deal with that are moving the spacecraft out of the plane of the orbit. So that is an interesting challenge. It's, it's not so much that it's difficult to do that. It's, it's the small body forces make it hard to plan how you do your observations. You have to worry about them a lot. 
Uh, finally, last steps are to what we call reconnaissance. So once we've selected a site that we want to go to, we're going to have to do a few uh, sort of flyovers, see how well we match certain waypoints as we um, approach the, the target, do that two or three times, develop confidence that we know what we're doing. And then finally, we'll drop down, go to the surface. It takes about two seconds to get the sample. We expect to get our, our requirements to get about 90 grams. We expect with the technologies we've been using about two kilograms of sample. I think we can get as much as two kilograms. Take that sample, pack it up, and come back home. Uh, and that's the plan. Uh, you can see we have some margin. Uh, if, if it takes us longer than we think, or the asteroid wobbling a lot, there's a bunch of things we don't really know. Uh, we have up to another year more, nearly 426 days of margin to, to, before we need to leave. Our baseline departure date, you see, is in 21. So if we do sample uh, as soon as uh, end of 2019, we will just hang around near the asteroid for a while uh, and then come back in uh, 2021. And we will arrive back at Earth um, in 2020 with a sample. And then the scientists really get busy. OK. Uh, here's a movie, actually, of how this works. So uh, this is a, so Goddard is one of our key, um, is actually the, managing the project. APL, I'll talk about our involvement here in a minute. Um, but this is basically the mission. It's approaching it much faster than would actually be happening. We, we approach, we start doing surveys, and in a minute, we have a suite of instruments that are going to pop up right now. Um, we have uh, several cameras, uh, two, two uh, thermal um, spectrometer and a, a UV uh, IR spectrometer, so low wavelength and, high, and short and high long wavelength uh, instrument. We've got a laser altimeter. It's actually a very cool laser altimeter. It's a scanning laser altimeter. Um, and, and here's the arm, actually, which is getting ready. We, this is, we've found our site. We're going for it. Um, it's called the tag SAM. Basically, the way we collect the sample is actually the, the tag SAM will touch the, the surface. We blow gas. It lifts up the, there you see the glass being blown. It actually kicks up the regolith, the loose stuff on the surface, and it gets caught in the basket. And then we take the basket, um, put it into our uh, return capsule, as you can see, pop it in there, and then by miracle, within seconds, you're at Earth. Um, <laughs> um, really not. It takes a while, as you saw on the timeline. Um, you pop that capsule off. The spacecraft gets uh, does not get lost, so it could potentially be used for future efforts if there's enough um, fuel left. And there you go. It gets dropped. It's going to be sent to Utah, that's where we usually collect these samples, and then um, analysis begins at JSC, Johnson Space Center. Um, so uh, let's go to the next slide. So one of the big challenges that I was talking to, and this is the part I'm most evolved in, is, um, as I said, we don't know a whole lot about the asteroid before we get there. In fact, the, the colored pictures there in the lower uh, um, left-hand corner are radar-shaped models. So Earth-based radar observations of this asteroid. So radar allows us to view the asteroid at about 10 meters per pixel. So that's sort of the resolution that we currently have. Uh, it looks like this kind of, um, uh, I would say, like a diamond-shaped, but sort of in 3D. Uh, we think these shapes are the result of a, a phenomenon that happens called the YORP effect. Uh, actually, YORP. Yeah, yeah. Yorp, um, it basically causes the asteroids to spin up or slow down. And through the spin up, it actually gains a shape by having the loose material sort of to the edges. You may have heard of this. Um, and so we think that's what's going on here. So actually, it's, um, it's interesting. So the blue stuff is actually where you, although they're on this ridge, the blue actually in this image is ele what we're showing is elevation. So that's the valley. It's the bottom of your valley. That's where all the sediment's likely to be sitting at, where we're probably going to go get that regolith. Um, the other figure is just showing you the slope. Uh, what is it? Slope distribution, yes. So that's uh, the blues are actually flat slopes. The reds are steep slopes. Um, just giving you an idea. And these are the kinds of maps we need in order to be able to, at least on a global level, say, hey, can we sample this asteroid? Where can we sample this asteroid? And so 
we need to spend about two months, uh, a little bit more, getting all the data. So uh, we have two approaches. One is imaging data, and then one is the laser. Um, so through imaging, you can use stereo to develop the topography, the shape model. And the other way uh, we do it is through the laser altimeter. Uh, it's a scanning laser altimeter. It shoots um, about 10,000 shots a second from a laser altimeter. Um, we'll be able, when we're really close, to get two, two centimeter shots with two centimeter spacing. It's going to be really remarkable. Um, so that's also the next part. So we, on next slide, we'll need to be able to get, once we've selected a safe sampling site, this is actually the surface of that asteroid Itokawa I showed you. Um, there, there's a region, a smooth region called the Musa Sea, um, where we actually, where actually the Japanese went down and tried to collect a sample. Uh, unfortunately, their sampling device didn't work, but they did collect some micron-sized stuff. Um, but this is, you know, the kind of site we would want to understand with that laser altimeter, make sure there's no big blocks like that block there in the corner. You don't you want to stay away from that, for example. Uh, and so that actually requires a much higher resolution, centimeter scale resolution. Uh, also, we have a requirement where we can't get certain size cobbles in our thing or things get stuck. So we have to look for a good place to go. And that's why we spend a, quite a lot of time doing the surveying at the beginning. Next slide. Um, once we've figured out our site, then, then it's how do you go and sample. And there's a few steps you need to do. The first thing is you need to, you, as I said, we're going to be in orbit. Uh, but you need to get close and match the speed of the asteroid uh, at about 100 meters above the surface. Um, once you're right, you, when you're the right matching speed, you need to figure out. So you, that topography I was telling you before is also very important for figuring out the corridor in which you're going to move in before you drop down. A lot of this, right, takes about 20 minutes from Earth, so you actually have a closed loop system during the final descent to to sample. Um, so we need to find a corridor. We actually have a small laser system, which will take the topography that we had and figure out where they're going and making sure they hit the corridor. Once they know they're going through that corridor safely, they come to the end of the corridor, drop down, get the sample, and as I said, get out of Dodge. When you have a billion dollar um, spacecraft and you've got your sample, you know, you're done. You want to go home. Um, so we'll be going out. Um, hanging around the asteroid. If we, if we do this in that baseline time frame, um, you know, we'll be there for another year. I bet we'll come back and look at what we did. Um, but initially, we probably won't because there's a lot of risk aversion. You know, it's an expensive sample. Um, next slide. Um, how does this work? Why can't we do this, really? I mean, Mars, I don't know. I'm sure you guys have heard about Mars sample return. You know, we've been talking about doing this for a long time. It's really hard in a big G environment. Even Mars is only one third of our own gravitational field, but it's challenging. Here we're talking about a hundred of our gravity fields. So that's what makes us makes this whole thing go. The other nice thing about this is, I didn't talk about this too much, but the orbits are slow. Uh, it's an 18-hour orbit when you're 700 meters above the surface, okay? Because the gravity is so slow. So if you just take Newtonian's law, you can you can figure this out. Um, and that's the other nice thing about going to the asteroids. Everything goes slow. Um, um, and so, and the forces you need to get off the surface are not big. So all these is why we're going to this asteroid and getting that sample on, um, back. Uh, I just wanted to talk, so my role, I'm a, I help a lot with the development, as you can tell, because we're doing all the topography. We're responsible for that and the laser altimeter. I'll just go to the next slide. Um, and so I'm really responsible for all these topographic products and uh, this is sort of giving you an overview of how we're going to be doing our observations to get down there and collect that sample, where we start out at about 700, uh, 7 kilometers, get our first shape models with our imaging systems and, and, and scanning lasers. And, and then finally, at 500 meters, we're going to do a bang-up job and get that one centimeter sort of per shot scale data. Uh, and then we'll be good to go and land. Get our sample. Well, I keep saying land. It's not land. We're touching and going. Touching so, right, yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> thank you. All right. Well, thank you, panelists. Like, uh, since I think we're gonna have the interaction here between we go to the next activity, I think what I want to do now is just if we can quickly go to the locations around the country to see if we can get at least a question in from each place. So we can start with Johnson. If there are any questions there for the panelists.
So I think we do have a question here from the Johnson Space Center. So we're going to have our first person come on up and ask her question. <laughs> start with one. Okay, I'll start with one. Um, okay, first of all, um, for Mr. McNutt, um, oh, my name is Nancy Stout, so I'm a middle school teacher here in Houston. Um, our students have an awful lot of perceptions about the surface of Mercury. For example, our kids, because it's so close to the sun, they think that the side that's facing the sun is almost completely molten. The side away from the sun is solid. So um, what's causing the volcanic activity um, on Mercury? So that's one question. Okay, so we'll start with that. Okay. Okay, well, the, gra the, gra the volcanic activity actually took place a long time ago. We think that the, uh, when the, the planet was a lot younger, we think that probably the last major things that happened on the surface of the planet uh, maybe occurred not too long ago, maybe a billion years ago. So this goes back a long time. Also, it turns out that Mercury actually does not always face with one side toward the sun. That's a misconception from uh, very early on, uh, up until the, some of these radar observations were made in the mid-1960s. It turns out that Mercury is lo lo excuse me, locked into a 3 to 2 resonance. And what that means is that for every three times that Mercury spins on its axis, it goes around the sun twice. So if you look at if you if you take a solar day on Mercury, that is uh, the amount of time between the sun being at one position in the sky and the next time the sun's in that position to the sky, it's actually two Mercury years or 176 days. And to really kind of see that, you actually have to you have to, I I still have to draw sketches of this to myself because, like I say, you're going around the sun on sort of the same time scale that the planet is rotating. So early on, uh, for example, a lot of people said, well, one side of Mercury is going to be incredibly cold, the other side incredibly hot. But it doesn't happen that way. The rotation actually spreads the heat out, except for those permanently shadowed craters at the poles. And those really are cold. So hopefully that answered your question. Uh, and are there any others that have questions, too? Let's go to another okay. question, and we'll, we'll hear back to you. We have a no, no, second no. question, and go. you can let us know. So come on up and, and ask your second question here. Hello, my name is Javier Montiel from Velasco Elementary. I have a question. Um, how is the communication system designed for, uh, you know, the signal that um, don't fade away, you know, from distance, you know, because it's, it's, it's um, traveling long, long time. So, how is that communication process with the uh, with Earth? Thank you. I guess that sounds like a distance. It must be a New Horizons question. We'll give that a shot. Yeah. Um, like yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, um, yeah, we are, you know, of course, with the New Horizons spacecraft, very, very far away from the Earth. Um, we have a uh, 2.1 meter dish, radio dish. Um, and very powerful transmitters, radio transmitters, that feed that dish and transmit the signal back to the Earth. But, you know, it's still pretty faint. By the time it gets to the Earth, you need the uh, huge dishes from the NASA's Deep Space Network, these 70-meter behemoths, uh, which are incredibly sensitive. And it takes four and a half hours one way. If you turn on a flashlight at Pluto, shine it back towards the Earth, that light takes four and a half hours to get to the Earth, similarly with the radio waves. Um, but it's, it's a combination of having fairly powerful radio transmitter on the spacecraft, uh, beaming it back you know, to the uh, Earth, and having these incredibly large dishes on the Earth that can collect very faint signals and make something out of them. Uh, so um, you know, that's, that's the way it's done. I guess the harder part of the challenge, too, right, because you can't communicate so quickly with the spacecraft means that a lot of commands have to be built in. It has to operate a lot on its own to make sure. Autonomously it, is what we say is, you know, you load everything up. You don't joystick these things. It's very different. Uh, you know, we have to – in fact, we spent a couple of years putting together uh, a sequence of commands that would be robust to things like uh, a cosmic ray coming in and upsetting the computer. If that happened, uh, 
we, you know, we have autonomy software on the spacecraft that will automatically kick in, and we won't lose any more than about six minutes of observing time. It'll automatically pick up the next activity. It'll, it'll experience a hiccup. <laughs> we might miss one observation, uh, but we have all of our most critical observations backed up with other ones. So, um, yeah. Critical. It's your observation that's <laughs> the yes. culprit. Uh, let's go to JPL for a question. The coordination of deep space. Good networks. morning. Uh, my name is David Falk. I'm from Los Angeles Valley College. This question concerns uh, Mercury, directed at uh, Dr. McNutt. Uh, your comment here about Mercury's magnetic field seems to be indicating that it does have a dynamo effect in its core. And I've always been telling my students it's kind of a puzzle as to why Mercury managed to hang on to its, uh, I guess, I guess its heat of formation to power that uh, effect. I was wondering if you can comment on this. Well, actually, that's a good question. I mean, there there has been a lot of controversy about that. One of the things that we had wanted to do was to characterize Mercury's gravity field well enough, along with being able to look at some ground-based observations to see whether that there still was a liquid core. And one of our team members, Jean-Luc Margot, who's actually a professor out at UCLA, did a lot of the ground-based radar work to be able to see that there actually are the effects you can see with the surface of mercury actually having a liquid core deep in the interior. And we've been able to characterize sort of the size of that core with the spacecraft. Now, why it is still liquid has been a bit of a mystery. We think that it's probably because that there's a lot of sulfur that's perhaps dissolved in the iron in the core. And what that tends to do is it tends to, it tends to, to um, lower the freezing point, and so actually at lower temperatures, the core can stay liquid. Uh, there are some strange things still about the, the, the gravitational, uh, what we see of the signs of the mass distribution of the core that has made us try to look again at exactly what sort of models of Mercury might make sense. And there may be some, uh, there may be some other uh, uh, funny chemistry going on that enables this core to actually work the way it does. The other thing that's very strange about the magnetic field is that it's like a dipole, but it's shifted about 400 kilometers north along the axis of the planet. So it's not centered at the center of the planet. So the dipole is, is actually, is actually uh, displaced. And there aren't any good theories for that. So there's still a lot of mysteries that are associated with this, but what we have been able to do is to show that there is indeed a substantive internal magnetic field. Uh, it's providing a magnetosphere for the planet, and it's being driven by some sort of internal dynamo action. And there is indeed still a liquid core to the planet. And a lot of the rest of it is still being worked on by the science team and by others using data from the, uh, from the spacecraft trying to put all the pieces of the puzzle together. I think I'm going to do uh, one more before we go to the activity. If we'll go to Montana to make sure all the sites have a chance to ask at least one question. Okay. Go ahead. Hi, my name is Wendy Delakich, and I teach um, high school physics and earth science in Livingston, Montana. My question um, is in regards to the Genesis mission. You mentioned several times something called the plasma roll. And something about it assisting with the pluto sharon occultation. I have a plasma unit that I have in my classroom, so I'm really curious about this. Uh, so uh, the plasma rolls are actually, uh, we've got two instruments, um, Pepsi and SWAP. SWAP is a solar wind instrument, and Pepsi is basically picking up high energy particles and stuff like that. Um, a plasma roll, they would basically want to get a 360 degree field of view of the region that they're in. So every week or so throughout the sort of approach phase, they're going to ask us to essentially do the equivalent of a barrel roll to rotate for 30 minutes uh, about the spin axis of the spacecraft to collect data so that they get a full 360 degree view of, of the of space. So that's just what it is. Okay. Um, Great questions. There were some comments and some of the questions that are here. The cool thing is when we move the activity, panelists will be around. So you have a chance to engage them in conversation here, at least on site. We're going to hand it off to the next part of this segment. So Julie Edmonds, and we're going to run the activity here that involves force. Right? Uh, 
some other aspects of, again, traveling through space and getting through to your destination. So we'll move to that part of the segment now. So, thank you, Julie.